the hands of the carpenter. It was Joseph of Arimathea who had the honor of taking the body of Jesus down from the cross. Think what it would have been like to have pulled the cold and lifeless hands of the Son of God from the thick barbed Roman nails. These were carpenter's hands, which once held nails and wood, now being held by nails and wood. These were the hands that broke bread and fed multitudes, now being broken to feed multitudes. These once applied clay to a blind man's eyes, touched lepers, healed the sick, washed the disciples' feet, and took children in his arms. These were the hands that, more than once, loosed the cold hand of death, now held firmly by its icy grip. These were the fingers that wrote in the sand when the adulterous woman was cast at his feet, and for the love of God fashioned a whip that purged his father's house. These were the same fingers that took bread and dipped it in a dish, and gave it to Judas as a gesture of deep love and friendship. Here was the bread of life itself, being dipped in the cup of suffering, as the ultimate gesture of God's love for the evil world that Judas represented. Joseph's shame, that had been afraid to own the Savior, sickened him as he tore the blood-sodden feet from the six-inch cold steel spikes that fastened them to the cross. These were the beautiful feet of him that preached the gospel of peace, that Mary washed with her hair, that walked upon the Sea of Galilee, now crimson with a sea of blood. As Joseph reached out his arms to get him down from the cross, perhaps he stared for an instant at the inanimate face of the Son of God. His heart wrenched as he looked upon him whom they had pierced. His face, which once radiated the glory of God on the Mount of Transfiguration, which so many had looked upon with such veneration, was now blood-stained from the needle-sharp crowns of thorns, deathly pale and twisted from the unspeakable suffering as the sin of the world was laid upon him. His eyes, which once sparkled with the life of God, now stared at nothingness as he was brought into the dust of death. His lips, which spoke such gracious words and calmed the fears of so many, were swollen and bruised from the beating given to him by the hardened fist and cruel soldiers. As it is written, his visage was so marred more than any man. Nicodemus may have reached up to help Joseph with the body. As the cold blood of the Lamb of God covered his hands, he was reminded of the blood of the Passover Lamb he had seen shed so many times. The death of each spotless animal had been so quick and merciful, but his death had been unspeakably cruel vicious, inhumane, and brutal. It seemed that the hatred that sin-loving humanity had for the light formed itself into a dark and evil spear, and was thrust with cruel delight into the perfect Lamb of God. Perhaps as he carefully pried the crown from his head, looked at the gaping hole in his side, the deep mass of abrasions upon his back, and the mutilated wounds in his hands and feet, a sense of outrage engrossed him, that this could happen to such a man as this. But the words of the prophet Isaiah rang within his heart. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, as a lamb to the slaughter. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Jesus of Nazareth was stripped of his robe, that we might be robed in pure righteousness. He suffered a deathly thirst, that our thirst for life might be quenched. He agonized under the curse of the law, that we might relish the blessing of the gospel. He took upon himself the hatred of the world, so that we could experience the love of God. Hell was let loose upon him, so that heaven could be let loose upon us. Jesus of Nazareth tasted the bitterness of death, so that we might taste the sweetness of life everlasting. The Son of God willingly passed over His life, that death might freely pass over the sons and daughters of Adam. May Calvary's cross be as real to us as it was to those who stood on its bloody soil on that terrible day. May we also gaze upon the face of the crucified Son of God, and may shame grip our hearts if ever the fear of man comes near our souls. May we identify with the Apostle Paul, who could have glorified in his dramatic and miraculous experience on the road to Damascus. Instead, 
he whispered in awe of God's great love. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world.